Hello friends, let's discuss this week's current affairs. To begin with, a question on geostrategic affairs. This is about uh, Australia's national defense strategy. Uh, I mean, the, every year they come out with this kind of uh, strategy paper and this year's paper talks about, you know, uh, India as a top tier security partner in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, Indo-Pacific would mean Indian Ocean as well as uh, the Pacific Ocean, you know, uh, Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans. Let's look at where um, Australia. This is where we are, my friends. And um, you can see that Australia is down under. In fact, uh, the other name for Australia, the nickname for Australia, especially in cricketing circles, would be down under. Down under is a word, is a term used for both uh, Australia and New Zealand. Now, why did the Brits, actually the Brits were the first to use this term. And why did they use this? They used this primarily to, you know, to look at, to, to, to tell us about the geographical location of these two parts of the world, which were down and under. If you look at the globe and, you know, if you do, you know, if you look at the globe as such, basically, you will find that Britain is at the top, you know, till when the earth tilts, basically, it's at the top. And, uh, you know, this is where down and under. From here, down under, basically. So, this is how they would say that the, the prisoners are going, are being sent down under. So, um, why would Australia and India come together to have defense cooperation, to have strategic cooperation. What would unite them? Considering that they do not share a land border, it's only a maritime boundary. This is a maritime, okay, let me use the red here. This is a maritime, but this is quite a large, quite a big gap in terms of, you know, quite a distance in terms of maritime uh, boundaries. So, you look at this way now, uh, what What's Australia afraid of? What country is it afraid of? Is it afraid of New Zealand? No. Is it afraid of Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, all these countries? No. Who is it afraid of? It's afraid of China. Why would Australia be afraid of China? Because China is claiming the whole of this area. It claims not just Taiwan. It claims, you can see this now, it claims this entire region here. Okay. This is what is called the nine dash, the nine dash line. Okay, it says this is all ours. This South China Sea is our lake. They call it the China Lake. They say historically, this the, you know this area has been a part of the Chinese Empire. Consequently, today it has to be a part of China. So they say that this is our sovereign territory. Now, all the you know this is this has brought Australian direct you know sorry it has brought China into direct confrontation with Vietnam, you know Philippines. Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia, not to speak of the other numerous tiny islands here, basically not there also. But let's look at this particular area. See, when China claims something at this particular area, please understand that a large part of this area is international waters. So, it's so it should be open to all countries. Now, coming to this area here, this is where we call what we call the EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone. The exclusive economic zone of a country extends about 200 nautical miles from the coast. So, this is which, which basically it is a sovereign economic territory of a country. A country like so for example, Philippines here, you know, um, Philippines can, the Filipino fishermen and all these guys can go into the sea and actually, you know, they can, you know, uh, they can catch fish. Then, you know, the, the Philippine government can mine these areas for whatever, basically hydrocarbons or minerals or whatever. But now China says, it's all ours, guys. You are coming in and you are claiming our resources. So, you better be careful. So, the Australians are worried about this entire thing. The Australians say, man, what would stop China claiming this entire area tomorrow? And China has been very aggressive on Australian university campuses. You know, uh, Australia has had um, a massive uh, security overhaul in the recent in recent times, primarily to stop um, you know China, you know, from coming in uh, um, with propaganda on its university campuses. Uh, you know, um, India has come in because India has India and Australia have a common enemy. That's China, my friends. So India and Australia, both democracies, are deepening. You know defense and economic cooperation. We also have 
we also have something called the MLSA. MLSA is Mutual Logistics Support Arrangement. Through this arrangement, let me repeat, Mutual Logistics Support Arrangement, through this agreement, the Indian and Australian militaries can access each other's military bases for logistic support and other, you know, other uses. Now, both India and Australia have what is called a comprehensive strategic partnership also. And ladies and gentlemen, what's bringing them together? A common fear of an aggressive China. So China is the elephant in the room and uh, while some countries may ignore, India is not ignoring you know, China. So is of course uh, Australia. Okay. So uh, how big is Australia? You know, it's about 76 lakh square kilometers big. 76 lakh kilo, kilo, square kilometer would mean that it's more than twice more than India's area. What's India's area? About 32.87 lakh square kilometers. Make it 33. 33 versus 76 lakh square kilometers. That's huge, my friends. Now, what's its population? About 2.6 crore. What's our population? About 145 crore. This is 2.6 crore. Well, that's because Australia is about 85% of Australia is urbanized. And you will find the, you know, most of the population living in this part of the world, in this part of Australia and here, Darwin and all this. That's about it. Okay. This region here is either da desert because Australia is home to both uh, the great uh, sandy desert and the Victorian desert. It's also home to the great outback, the Australian outback, which is one of the world's most dangerous places to frequent. Okay. So, the inhospitable climate makes Australia a difficult place to live, my friends. It's a flattest, driest continent on the planet. Okay. So, that's a bit about this and... Uh, just I'll tell you where is Malaysia, my friends. This is Malaysia. Use this portion you can see here. This is Malaysia and this portion again is Malaysia. This island you see here, this particular island here is called the island of Borneo. Island of Borneo and uh, the island of Borneo I think is the third biggest island in the world. The largest is Greenland. Second is the New Guinea island, this entire island. Third is Borneo. In the, you know, when you say look at Borneo like this, Okay, uh, the southern part is Indonesia, the northern part is Malaysia, but within the northern part, there is a country called Brunei. What is the country? Brunei, B-R-U-N-E-I. You can see it here. Let me clear this and this you can find it here. This is Brunei, a tiny country, in fact, so tiny that we have not even, the map does not even mention the, uh, you know, the name of the country. Okay, so that's about it, my friends. I guess that should take care of a lot of things. Hmm? Let's get on with the business. Who has made history? And I think uh, last week we discussed the name of the women candidate. And this year it's someone else. Based. This um, yeah, week it's someone else in the, that is in the men's category. And we are proud to say that our Dhammaraj Gukesh has become the youngest ever challenger to the world title. He won the 2024 candidates tournament. 2024 candidates tournament, my friends, was held in Toronto. Where was it held? The championship was held in Toronto, which as you know is in Canada. Okay. Uh, both the women's candidates tournament, chess tournament, as well as the men's tournament was held in, were held in Toronto. Now, let me tell you something more, my friends. Gukesh is the third youngest grandmaster, third youngest grandmaster in history. And he's the youngest in two things. He is the youngest in two categories, you know, in two major ways. One, youngest to, you know, uh, to win the candidates tournament and youngest to achieve a ELO rating of 2750 points. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is the youngest grandmaster to achieve an ELO, ELO, that is a chess rating of 2750 points. That's huge, my friends. Yeah. So, our Gukesh has done the country proud, he has country, you know, you and me proud and I'm sure that he is only going to go further from here. And who is he going to challenge in the World Championship Final 2025? 2025, the final will be, you know, he will challenge the Chinese player Ding Liren. Ding Liren. Okay. So, that's it, my friends. All these guys, my friends, are in the top 25 in the world. Almost, yeah, almost all of them are in the top 25 in the world.
let me take you further on this which countries researchers have developed a high power high you know hybrid sodium ion battery we have li normally lithium ion battery this sodium ion battery that can be charged in seconds south korea has come up with this south korea is home to companies like samsung you have you know uh, what is it um, uh, hyundai let me make it hyundai then it is home to lg and all of these companies are called there is a particular word they use zebol it is written with a c it is pronounced with pronounced with a j okay J ball. Now, what's a J ball? A J ball is uh, a family owned large business conglomerate. Let me repeat a family owned, you know, a large family owned business conglomerate. So, that's J ball, my friends. Okay. So, you know, Hyundai also owns Kia. And earlier, okay, just one thing many people think the full form of LG is Lucky Gold uh, is life's good. It's actually, ladies and gentlemen, Lucky Gold Star. What is it? Lucky Gold Star. So, you know, um, I think I, I don't really want to fo focus on this question except that whatever I mentioned here. Uh, name the active volcano on Antarctica that has been in use for spewing gold, my friends, it's gold. Luckily, it's an Antarctica, it's a pretty cold place that people like us cannot frequent, cannot go on a normal day also. So, uh, this is the Mount Erebus, my friends, Mount Erebus, this is it. And it's the second tallest in a volcano in uh, Antarctica, which is the tallest volcano in Antarctica, Sydney, Mount Sydney is the tallest volcano in Antarctica. And But this is also not the tallest mountain in Antarctica. The tallest mountain in Antarctica is Vinson Massif. Vinson Massif. Vinson Massif is the tallest peak in you know, what is it? Uh, Antarctica, it is uh, about 4,892 meters, 4892 meters. Okay. Now, let me tell you something that, uh, you know, um, is a kind of story. It's just a one and a half minute story. Now, we know Antarctica, we have heard of the Arctic. We know where are these. The Arctic is in the North Pole, Antarctica is in the South Pole. So, ladies and gentlemen, how did the names come? The names come like this, uh, have come, you know, because of certain things. Arctic, look at this. Before we discuss Antarctic, we need to understand the word Arctic. Arctic, okay, which is the North Pole, comes from the Greek word Arctos. Arctos means Bhalu, bear. It means bear, okay. It also means of the northern because the Greeks believed and it's true that in the northern part of the sky, which is towards the pole, you have, you know, the great bear constellation and the minor bear constellation, little bear constellation. So, they would use the word Arctos for Bhalu, okay, and they call that area Arctos. Arctos gave birth to Arctic and Arctic, while it's in the north pole, in the south pole, there is something else. You know, a, 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 another polar desert, just like the Arctic, another polar desert, but at the extreme end of the earth. So, ladies and gentlemen, un, anti Arctic is Antarctic. Anti Arctic is Antarctic. That's how it, when it comes. Antarctic is anti Arctic. Okay. So, Arctic from the Greek word Arctos, which means Bhalu, bear, and uh, you know, because uh, Antarctic is located bang opposite of where the Arctic is, we have anti-Arctic, friends, okay. I have always been fascinated with, you know, with, uh, with learning, you know, uh, with all of these kinds of things. How do place names come? Why are we, why are we calling something so and so? Like, for example, Srinagar. It just came to me now, okay. I didn't even plan to uh, discuss this. Srinagar, the Sri is, Sri is the other name of Ma Lakshmi. So, Srinagar is... The city of is named after Ma Lakshmi, the city of prosperity. The city of prosperity. That's the meaning of the word Srinagar, my friends. Okay. It's named, named after Ma Saraswati. Sorry, Ma Lakshmi. Uh, who of the following has won the Formula One's first? You know, after five years, China has conducted a Formula One championship and it is won by Max Verstappen, the 
2021-22-23 current world champion, my friends. Okay, he's a three-time defending world champion, so we'll not spend them there. He comes from the country of Netherlands. What is the country? Last week also we discussed his name and his record, so we'll just touch and go now. Netherlands. Okay, so he drives for Red Bull Honda. Red Bull Honda. The European Commission has introduced a cascade version of the Schengen visa. No, I am not really interested in the cascade version. All I am interested in is the Schengen visa. The Schengen visa area is an, is an area encompassing 29 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the 29 countries. In blue, you find 27 countries. 27 countries. All members of the European Union, not really all, basically. But um, there are two members of the European Council, Euro European Union which are not part of the Schengen visa. One is Ireland. This is Ireland. Okay. This is Ireland. You can see this. The northern is, is the north is uh, Northern Ireland. This portion is not, you know, Ireland. I'll put it here. Okay. Then there is a country here called Cyprus or Cyprus. C-Y-P-R-E-S. Okay. These two countries are not part of the Schengen visa. Now, the Schengen visa, what it does is this. It gives you, it treats the entire block, 29 countries, 27 plus 2. What are the two? This is, um, you know, uh, Romania and this is Bulgaria. These two countries, my friends, um, have just joined the Schengen area and uh, they have only maritime boundaries, air boundaries, which are not, where travel is not checked. I'll tell you what is it. See, the Schengen visa. E, e, Schengen area is one area treated as one area for the visa purpose. So, if you have a Schengen visa, okay, it means that you can access all these countries without internal border checks. So, when you are moving from Portugal to Spain, there is no border check. From here, okay, this Andorra here, you are, there is no border check. This is France, absolutely, you can move this to this entire area without any border checks, okay, no internal border checks. So. The border checks basically are the checks are only when you enter and when you exit. That's it. So, for the purpose of you know travel, international travel, no internal border checks are there in the Schengen area. So, with one visa, you can travel to the entire set of 29 countries. Now, as far as Bulgaria and Romania are concerned, yes, currently land borders are not there, but internal checks are present for land borders, but not for air and maritime boundaries. So, that's how it is. So, if you want to travel to Europe, you can as well take a Schengen visa, which will open doors to all of these countries for you. Okay, guys. For which nation has a US Senate? The US Senate is the upper house of the US Parliament. Okay, we have the Rajya Sabha, they have the Senate. The Senate has 100 members. The Senate has 100 members. And the US um, lower house called the House of the Representatives has 435 representatives. 435 representatives. In the lower house, upper house has 100. So, the US Senate has approved a $95 billion foreign aid package for three countries. Uh, Ukraine will get $61 billion. Israel will get 26. Taiwan will get the rest. That's the idea, my friends. Ta not just Taiwan. Taiwan, we are talking of Indo-Pacific, including Taiwan, they will get the rest. So, there has been intense opposition to this, but it still was passed. You know, the bill was still passed, basically. So, there has been a great deal of opposition because, uh, you know, uh, the American Republicans especially say that uh, there should be a greater scrutiny. We, sh we should have a greater scrutiny of the money that we give to Ukraine because we have been pumping billions of dollars, but there has been no account, you know, of those that money, basically, that we have sent over. And we are not holding the Ukrainians accountable for the money that we have sent them. So... There is a great deal of angst, a great deal of anger. But as, a, as far as Israel is concerned, there is bipartisan support. Bipartisan support would mean more or less support across the parties, basically. Okay, across the political divides. Okay, which who has won the 2024 World Laureus Sports Man of the Year? Award? Okay, that's the great Novak Djokovic, one of the top three in the history of the you know sport. Uh, tennis, lawn tennis sport. And as far as the woman is concerned, who won the sports woman award? I'll just write the name of the woman, my friends. And uh, uh, 
that would be Ayman Bonmati. Ayman Bonmati is a Spanish footballer. Spanish footballer. Okay. Spanish footballer. So she was chosen to be for the glorious world sports woman of the year award for the you know award. So Ayman Bonmati of Spanish football team. So, and Novak Djokovic comes from Serbia. He comes from Serbia. I'm not going to discuss this further. Sports is not something that, uh, you know, stimulates me. But of course, I love to discuss this, how they have become so, you know, so good at what they do. That's because of mental strength. That's because of constant, consistent hard work and learning, especially learning from their failures. That's something that should inspire us, my friends. Yeah. Name the president of the COP28. COP is Conference of Parties. This is part of the United Nations Framework on Climate Change. Framework Convention. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Okay. Um, this uh, holds this uh, event here. Uh, this is COP28. And COP28 is Conference of Parties 28, the 28th summit of this, 28th meeting of this, uh, these parties. And it was held in, what is it? Um, it was held in Abu Dhabi. It was held in, you know, the United Arab Emirates. United Arab Emirates. And the COP29, see, it was COP28 was headed by the United, United Arab Emirates Minister, um, you know, Sultan Al Zabar. So, he has been given this award. So, I am not going to discuss that. COP29, this is important, will be held in Baku. Will be held in Baku. And ladies and gentlemen, Baku is a capital of Azerbaijan. It's a capital of Azerbaijan. Okay. So, that's a bit about this. Yeah, who, you know, which public sector unit has been conferred with the uh, Outstanding Public Sector Undertaking of the Year Award? Uh, this is the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, it was started by, you know, uh, Wal Chand. Oh, what did I write? I was writing the second name first. Wal Chand Hira Chand. Wal Chand Hira Chand also started Hindustan Shipyard, which is in Vishakhapatnam. Later, the government took over the... Later, the government took over Hindustan shipyard and um, also took over HAL. So, Walchand Hirachand, of, um, you know, um, he was uh, uh, a merchant from, uh, a Jain merchant from near, uh, what is the place, Sholapur. And he started these um, companies and, uh, you know, today it's doing great because uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, my friends, is, um, um, is a manufacturer of... Um, Tejas, it's a manufacturer of light combat aircraft Tejas, it's a manufacturer of um, you know, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, drones like Rustum, okay, uh, Nishant, Laksha, there are, you know, I'll write it here, Laksha, uh, then it's also manufactures helicopters like Dhruv, Rudra, Dhruv, Rudra, Prachanda, there is Prachanda also. So, I just gave you something, okay, a few things basically. So, Hindustan Aerodex Limited is one of the world's largest aerospace and defense contractors, defense manufacturing companies, okay. Uh, its chairperson, there is no full time chairperson right now, but its interim CMD, Chairman Managing Director, is CB Ananta Krishnan. CB Ananta Krishnan. Okay, and it's a 29,000 crore company. Last year, its revenues were about 29,000 crore, my friends. So, guys, let's get on with the business here. Uh, let me clear this. So, which company, which uh, organization has come, be, come, you know, come out with Climate Strategy 2030? Climate Strategy 2030, you know, um, with the aim of addressing India's need for green financing. Green financing is environmentally friendly uh, policies, uh, you know, projects and all that. And uh, at the same time, uh, you know, projects that would lead to sustainable development. 
So NABAD, NABAD is a National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development. Ladies and gentlemen, let me repeat for you, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development is NABAD. It was started in 1982, 1982, okay. It is headquartered in Mumbai. It is a regulatory body for, you know, uh, what you call state cooperative banks, district cooperative banks, regional rural banks, okay regional rural banks where and it's headed by k you know it is headed by shaji kv that's how the name is nowhere did i find the full form of kv shaji kv what are the choices here the choices go like this uh, what about uh, sidbi sidbi is small industries development bank of india it's headquartered in lucknow it's headquartered in lucknow Currently, there is no full-time chairperson of this. Remember this, you could just check the website of SIDBI. There is no full-time chairperson of this. Uh, IDBI Bank is Industrial Development Bank of India. That is the old full name. Nowadays, it does not use the old full name. It simply calls itself IDBI Bank and its chairperson is Rakesh Sharma. Rakesh Sharma. Rakesh Sharma. What about SEBI? Uh, sorry, what about SBI? Se um, you know, State Bank of India. State Bank of India is headed by Dinesh Kumar Khara, K H A R A. Dinesh Khara. Exim Bank is Export Import Bank of India. Export Import Bank of India is headed by uh, Deputy, uh, sorry, by Managing Director named Harsha Bangari. Harsha Bangari is the Managing Director of, you know, uh, Exim Bank of India. She has been there for a long time uh, as the MD. Which is not a host city of the Archery World Cup 2024. Well, uh, it is being held in four cities. So, from between April to October 2024, in four cities, the Archery World Cup would be held. It would be held in these places. And this is where the finals would be held. The finals would be held in the Mexican city of Tiaxcala. Tiaxcala. So, in Turkey, China, South Korea, uh, Mexico. Currently, it's being held in this. Uh, in, in April, it was held in Shanghai, China. Okay. Former world number one, Garbin Muguruja, who is retired from tennis, um, is of course associated with tennis. Yeah, and she won two Grand Slam events. As you know, there are four Grand Slam events in a year, in alphabetical order, in, in the calendar order, uh, chronological order, it would be Australian Open, followed by French Open, Wimbledon and the US Open. Let me repeat, Australian Open, French Open, Wimbledon and Australia. Um, um, the US Open. She is won two uh, Grand Slam events and um, um, you know you should know that um, she is um, she is um, okay she is won two Grand Slam events and uh, let me come back to this and ah uh, yes yes where were we oh, oh we go for we went forward I guess yes She's won two Grand Slam events and please know that um, she is um, she's won French Open in 2016 sometime and the Wimbledon Open. So, two actually Wimbledon is the tournament. She's won the French Open which is a clay tournament, clay court and Wimbledon which is a grass tournament. Okay. So, and she's from where? I forgot to tell you that. Ladies and gentlemen, she is from Spain. Garbin Muguruja is from Spain. She was born in Venezuela, but she is a Spanish player. Okay, you all know that Spain, you know, um, Venezuela in South America was also a part of the Spanish Empire for a long, long time. Citing data security concerns and uh, deficient infrastructure, IT infrastructure, the Kotak, sorry, Kotak Mahindra Bank has been asked by the RBI not to take on more consumers in issue credit cards. So, it has categorically told the bank, you cannot, you know, take on, uh, that is onboard clients online. You cannot issue credit cards. So, because these are all very sick, you know, uh, uh, very important data 
and if IT infrastructure is deficient, people could sneak into break into systems and steal consumer data. And this is the reason why the RBI has been pretty harsh on you know um, certain banks, like for example, Bank of Baroda, HDFC Bank, and of course now Kotak Mahindra Bank. Kotak Mahindra Bank's uh, MD is uh, Ashok Vaswani. Ashok Vaswani. Okay. ICIC Bank is headed by Sandeep Bakshi. Sandeep Bakshi. Uh, IDFC First Bank. I forgot to get info. Oh, I think it is V. Vaidyanathan. V. Vaidyanathan. V. Vaidyanathan. Yes, Bank. Prashant Kumar. It's been doing very well now. Um, the bank is doing quite well. Indusind Bank. Indusind Bank, my friends, is headed by Sumant Katpalia. Sumant. Okay, I'll write it here. Katpalia. Sumant Katpalia. You know, Sumant Katpalia's bank, Indusind Bank, is owned by the Hinduja Group. What is that? Hinduja Group. Uh, which Indian Prime Minister has, has recently been featured on Newsweek magazine's cover? Now, Newsweek at one time was the magazine. It was published from London, um, New York. The magazine it is. It no longer has um, much of print edition, actually. Yeah. So, um, Indira Gandhi was featured uh, in the past, now it is Narendra Modi. Uh, I will not get into the entire details here, but uh, I want you to know that Indra Kumar Gujral was the Prime Minister of India for a very short time, 1996 to 97. Indra Kumar Gujral. Narasimha was Prime Minister, um, sorry, uh, Narsim, let me clear this first. He was the Prime Minister between 1991 and 96. Manmohan Singh Ji between 2004 to 2014. Vajpayee Ji three times, okay, they here two times, uh, Singh Sab two times, while Vajpayee Ji three times, 13 days, 1998. <laughs> I am just being specific here. Let me clear this so that you know things are that much clearer. Uh, then 13 months, 1998 to 99, then 5 years, 99 to 2004. Okay, yeah. So, I guess you get this, yeah. Let's clear this. Where do we go from here? The European Parliament. The European Parliament, my friends, has adopted a strictly legally binding air pollution limit that is going to come to come into you know um, practice effect in 2030. Now, they these kinds of limits, you know, are sometimes lowered or sometimes revised upwards. But then again, you know, there is a lot at stake here. Um, of course, climate, clean, clean air, climate change, uh, global warming, all these things. And Europe has been at the forefront of these kinds of things, green initiatives and all. Now, what about the European Parliament? The European Parliament, my friends, is the second. He has about 705 members of European Parliament. 705 members of European Parliament. They are going to revise the number to upwards to 720 in June this year. But as of today, this is a number. Okay. Now, what you also need to know that the head office, the way that is where it sits, the way the Parliament sits, is in a place called Strasbourg. Uh, Strasbourg, as you know, is uh, you know in France. Strasbourg is in France. It also has another uh, sitting, um, you know, uh, legislature in the Belgian city of Leopold. But let's skip to the main. Let's stick to the main place, Strasbourg in France. Okay, that's the head office of European Parliament. And see, uh, when they say 720 MEPs from June, as of today, the European Union. Ha holds elections for its European Parliament. Remember one thing that those elections for the European Parliament have the second largest, you know, uh, democratic exercise, second largest electorate, because the largest electorate is in our country about, you know, um, 900 million, that's 90 crore. People say 90 crore, some say 85 crore. Let's stick to whatever the number above 85 crore. And in the case of European Union, it is going to be about 38 crore. 
38 crore all of them put together okay all the countries put together so okay who among the following has been named the ambassador of the international cricket council t20 world cup um, you know to be played uh, this year in june in the united states and the caribbean islands uh, of west indies okay uh, it's going to be the jamaican superstar Usain Bolt, I think he's from Jamaica. Um, Usain Bolt, my friends, he is a world champion sprinter, 100 meters world champion sprinter. Uh, why did the ICC choose uh, a non cricketer? The idea is to have someone who is world famous, whose cross, whose, whose appeal, international appeal across geographies, across sporting disciplines, could also you know push the popularity of cricket up, basically. That's the idea. Okay. So, it's cross sports uh, uh, appeal is what they are looking at, my friends. Okay. For the first time in the Indian banking industry, which company has, which bank has launched ATM insurance? ATM is automated teller machine. You all know the meaning, no? The automated teller. Earlier, a bank before computerization everything used to have an official called teller. If this guy would tell the details of the accounts if you asked him basically that's why teller so automate now the machine does the function so it's automated teller machine and it's programmed to do certain things that's why automated now now through the atm they are also selling insurance and that ladies and gentlemen is small finance bank named au small finance bank it is headed by its md ceo is uh, what's the name sanjay agarwal sanjay agarwal sanjay agarwal okay heads AU Small Finance Bank. Let me tell you one more bank. Hmm. Ujjivan. Ujjivan Small Finance Bank is headed by Ittira Davis. Ittira Davis. MDCEO is Ittira Davis. Okay, I guess that's uh, a bit about. Now, uh, I'll tell you something here. When banks directly sell it, you know, insurance through their branches, it's called bank assurance. What is it called? Bank assurance. Bank assurance is, is you know, is a, is a basically a sale channel, sales channel of insurance through banks. That's it, bank branches. Okay. So, from here, the IRDI, which is the Inf um, Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India, has abolished the age restriction of 65 years b for buying health insurance. Up to 65 years, one person could a person could buy insurance, health insurance in India. That was a norm till recently. Now the IRDI has said, "Well, guys, you could go beyond 65 and purchase insurance if, of course, there is a seller." Now, why would companies have this kind of an age limit? Because see, as we age, um, the body Body becomes vulnerable to a host of diseases of course if proper care is not taken um, there is a host of lifestyle diseases immunity diseases and all that stuff uh, and um, as um, people really you know beyond some 65 takes an insurance policy the premium also goes up because we are near immortality after that isn't it so and irida is headquartered in hyderabad is headquartered in hyderabad and it's Headed by Debashish Panda. Debashish Panda. Debashish Panda. P A N D A. Panda. Okay. Yeah. Let's go past this. The World Economic Forum special meeting on global co op collaboration, growth, and energy was held in. Uh, Riyadh, which as you know is the capital of Saudi Arabia. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia's capital is Riyadh. It's also host, going to host 2034 Asian Games. See, this is what I do. I would normally, there's not much to discuss here as far as the meeting is concerned. And we have been discussing the World Economic Forum for a long time now. In fact, last week also we discussed World Economic Forum. But if you look at something extra here, 2034 Asian Games will be held in Riyadh. Okay. Uh, Nur Sultan, this ladies and gentlemen will be the new capital of Indonesia. Indonesia's traditional capital is um, for a long time, for several decades now, the capital has been Jakarta, but Jakarta is sinking because of the sheer weight of the population and the structures. Okay, so the capital is sinking and 
the you know we saw Borneo a while ago isn't it and in Borneo province there is a lower part called Kalimantan the Indonesian part of uh, Borneo is called Kalimantan okay in Kalimantan there is a city where the government which is a town small town called Nur Sultan little away from that the government of Indonesia is building a brand new capital up from scratch brand new capital my friends so they basically they they say that we will build a new city called Nur Sultan okay um, no no I think um, uh, uh, I'll just tell you Nur Sultan is I'm so sorry that uh, Indonesian capital is Nusantara. Nusantara. I'll come to that that particular part. You now forgive me for that error. Nusantara is going to be the capital of Indonesia. Since I mentioned that, it is going to be the capital of Indonesia. Okay. Now, as far as Nul Sultan is concerned, this is the old name of um, the Kazakhstan capital. Okay, Kazakhstan's capital. Now, uh, Almaty. Astana okay so they are going to they actually renamed it from Almaty they called it Nur Sultan now why did they call it Nur Sultan now they of course they gone back to Almaty now they called it Nur Sultan because this was the name of their former president Nur Sultan Najarbayev I think too much um, who is going on in the brain that's why I got confused here Nur Sultan Najarbayev okay this guy was a dictator, my friends. For a long time, he ruled the country. Even today, he is there. Um, in a Central Asia, when a word ends in with V, it's pronounced with an F. It's pronounced with an F. So, even if you say Najarbayev, it won't make any difference. Nur Sultan Najarbayev uh, gave his um, name to the capital, Astana. Uh, but you know what happened? Uh, you know... The government came, a new government has come in, new president has come in, uh, Kasim, led by Kasim Jomar Tokayev. But, you know, uh, the, the name proved to be unpopular, pretty unpopular. Though this is a country where freedoms are not very easy to come by for the ordinary people of the, you know, nation. But still, people were quite unhappy with the new name. And so, they, the country went back to the old name of the capital. Okay. And where is this guy today? Is it dead? No, no, no. He ruled the country with an iron fist from 1994 till recently. And you should know that he is uh, um, the chairperson of the Supreme Council of Kazakhstan. Yes, he is there. He is not gone anywhere. He runs the country proxy through the president called Kasim. Kasim Jomarth Tokayev. Don't worry too much about it. Okay, sometimes uh, these kinds of... If you still want to write the name of the Kazakhstan president, Kasim Zomarth. This is the only question where we got a bit uh, taken in by some word called, yeah, the new place, yeah, yes. This is, a cap this is um, the president of Kazakhstan. Manama is the capital of Bahrain. You all know this tiny island in the Gulf nations, okay, in the Gulf area. Muscat is the capital of Oman. Okay. So, the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, Climate Resilience Fund, has been set up to shield refugees and other displaced persons from climate shocks. Where is it headquartered? It's headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the UN United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is headed by uh, Filippo Grandi. Filippo Grandi. He is from Italy. Filippo Grandi is the Director General of UNHCR. Okay. Filippo Grandi. So, let me tell you something more. Let us look at some airports. I just came to my mind why do not we discuss airports? Always we have been discussing, you know, we have always been discussing organizations, people and all that. Let us be a little different today. Paris is home to the great, you know, gateway to France, Charles de Gaulle Airport. He was a former president of France, Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle Airport, this is the name of the airport, okay. Brussels Airport is called Brussels International Airport. Berlin is home to Brandenburg Airport. Brandenburg Airport. Oh, this airport was in the making for a long, long, long time. 
London is home to a lot of airports. Heathrow is a popular one. Then there is Gatwick, Stansted. Yeah. So this is a more popular one. Heathrow. Yeah, I think there is an error here. Heathrow. Hmm. So Geneva Airport is also typically called Geneva International Airport. Okay, according to the UNCTAD, United, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. What is this? United Nations Conference on Trade and Development report. India's annual services exports grew to what? Grew by, you know, uh, grew, by, uh, grew to 11.4% against a global average of 8.9. Now, look, what is the global services exports? Global services exports were 7.9 trillion dollars. I'm talking dollars, okay, 7.9 trillion dollars, the global exports. Uh, India's exports, India's exports went up by 11%. Uh, India's exports were 345 billion dollars. Okay, let me make, bring in simplicity to this. How many billions make 1 trillion? 1000 billion. So, let's make it easy for you, okay. Let's make it easy. Globally, it is 7,900 billion dollars. Okay, guys. 7,900 billion. Now, of this, ladies and gentlemen, 345 came from India. 345 came from India. But you also have to understand that uh, this is basically only exports. These are only exports. China has been a pretty strong export of services. But last year, it contracted. We grew by 11%. China contracted by 10% and its ex, you know, services exports came down to $381 billion. So, the number actually fell in China's case, where in India's case, it's been plus 11, a little over 11. Okay. So, that's about it. Our imports, services imports, these are exports. Okay. Our services imports, I'm just talking of India's numbers only, 245. Uh, sorry, two. 48 billion dollars. Our imports in the same period we imported services worth 248 billion dollars. See, services is the third sector. You have primary agriculture and allied activities like plantation, aquaculture, and all that stuff. Uh, coming to secondary, which is manufacturing, industrialization, industry, and all that. I am coming to the third one, tertiary. Tertiary is three. So, tertiary sector, services sector, invisible sector. You have tourism, insurance, banking, all that stuff. You know, um, so our imports of those services were $248 billion. Our exports were $345 billion in that period, my friends. Okay. Oh, that's all from me, Bharat C. Jain. Have a lot of fun. Thank you for being here. Stay curious.